Hey guys, welcome back to the Foam Frat podcast. We got an episode today on warfarin, uh, vitamin K antagonist reversal. And I do a talk that's called the reversal rehearsal. And I was trying to figure out how to frame a talk that's on uh, anticoagulants and trauma because the clotting cascade is one of the most intimidating things to me. I learn it and I forget it and I learn it and I forget it. And I thought it'd be cool to have like a, a conversational dialogue. And I saw this picture. I don't even know where the picture came from, but um, it was it looked like an attending talking to two residents. And I thought, you know what? I could kind of see a conversation occurring where you have an attending and he, it's kind of a slow day. You know, we know how like if you have a student on the ambulance or the helicopter, you put them through scenarios. And I thought we could create this game called reversal rehearsal. So he's got this deck of cards and he says, all right, you know, pick a card. They pick one. It's got a patient presentation on it and it's got a anticoagulant that they're on. And so I go through uh, warfarin. I got one that's on the direct oral anticoagulants. Uh, we got one coming up on heparin, but it's always an anticoagulant. And then you got some sort of uh, injury that occurs and you got to figure out, do I reverse it? How do I reverse it? And it kind of sets the table uh, for that conversation. So Sam, you read through the blog. Uh, what was your first thoughts? Well, I, I started thinking about that wharf thing. I liked the uh, I liked the shout out to Wisconsin. I'm actually forgetting what it stands for. Wisconsin Alumni W A Research Foundation. Research Foundation. Is that yeah. what it is? Yeah, I remember somebody telling me that. And I was really surprised that that's where the wharf and warfarin comes from. Came from. I was I was thinking about that. So the uh, and then I had a real dad joke. Well, I had the makings of a real dad joke when I looked into it. I was hoping that the so you talked about these cows. So this is how this came about is these cows were eating what turned out to be some moldy hay. Right. And so they ate yeah. this moldy hay, this guy's and they were bleeding out. Right. And so th this guy, this farmer brings these cows over to this research foundation and they essentially figured out that this whatever was whatever substance was inside of this hay was causing uh, epoxide oxidase to not be present, right? It was like binding with epoxide oxidase. Epoxide Messing reductase, with, yeah. Reductase. And yeah. then that was causing a, an issue with the vitamin K, and then they were bleeding. And that research foundation he, the farmer brought the cows to was, yeah, the Wisconsin Alumni Research, WARF, right? Research Foundation. And the whole time I was reading that, I was thinking... It is such a shame that those were cows and not sheep. Because then you could say that they had a they had a problem with their vitamin K. <laughs> 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 I was thinking that there is such a such a good joke and memory aid missing from that story, but uh, I'll have to I'll have to figure out another way to to remember it. But I thought that was an interesting interesting story. So yeah, maybe talk about that. So how does this epoxide reductase mess with this vitamin K. So we need the vitamin K in order to help with our clotting factors, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, you know, 1920s, you, the, a lot of uh, like financial economical hardship. And what would happen is, and, and Brittany Granfield was telling me this. When clover gets put up as in baled wet, it causes mold. Um, so normally uh, clover has um, what's called coumarol in it. And then with the mold, it um, it turns that into dicoumarol, which is um, something that inactivates vitamin K. And so those cows would eat that sweet clover hay and it had the mold on it. And something was happening internally that was causing them like perfectly healthy cows to all of a sudden start bleeding and internal bleeding and die. And so the uh, there was a couple of veterinarians around that time that were trying to figure out why this was occurring. And they realized if they took the mold off the hay, the cows could eat it and they would be fine. And if they took the cows that had already eaten the hay and they did a blood transfusion, that those cows would be fine. So it was something to do with the mold. Well, they just kept feeding their cows this clover hay because they couldn't replace it. It wasn't until like 1940-ish um, that a Wisconsin farmer was like, all right, I've had enough of this. And he put his dead cow in his truck and he took a um, it was like a, a paint can or something, milk can of the blood and went to this experimental agricultural station. And he met with some chemists and they were able to isolate that there was something that was inhibiting epoxide reductase, which 
there's it's, it's a really complicated process. But essentially, what the way my brain makes sense of it is we don't eat enough leafy vegetables on a daily basis to always provide ourselves with a adequate amount of vitamin K. And so vitamin K is needed in order to mature factors two, seven, nine, and 10. And so in the blog, I say it's kind of like the graduation ceremony. I think of it like the guy that hands out the diploma. So you imagine the two, seven, nine, and 10 are coming to their graduate graduation ceremony. They're getting their diploma, and then they can go to get a good job working in the clotting cascade and building a clot. Well, epoxide reductase is what allows you to recycle and activate inactive vitamin K. So your body is always in this state of like mm. activating it and then deactivating it and activating it and deactivating it. And if you lose the ability to reactivate it, then you can't mature that factor two, seven, nine, and 10. And that is what affects the extrinsic pathway. And so that's what warfarin does is it doesn't necessarily work on vitamin K directly, but it prevents that switch from being able to activate that again. So then, and that, so you're saying that you can store this vitamin K, but essentially you can't activate it. And so that like, so vitamin K is stored in the liver and then your gut has a, has a role in essentially you know, extracting this vitamin K, right? So if you have gut floor issues, if you have liver issues, that's also an issue with, with vitamin K. And so that's, if you think about liver failure patients, they're especially at risk of bleeding, right? So if they can't store vitamin K very well, that's that's the first issue if they have a, a some kind of hepatic disease. And then two, that's also where your clotting factors are made, right? All the enzymes for your clotting factors. So if you have liver failure, I mean, no wonder they can get a high INR, right? They have like two problems. They have an, an end product issue with the clotting factors, and then plus they have like a vitamin K storage issue. Yeah, exactly. And, and or they can also have a situation where they don't break down the clot and they're prone to mm. clotting because there's other factors that go into that as well. But making sense of how this whole process occurs really translates well into like the treatment of it. Right. So mm. one of the things that we discuss in the blog is the PTINR. So that's your way of looking at the extrinsic pathway. And so the PT is really like the root of it. So what you're doing, it's the prothrombin time. So they're, they're getting the blood from the patient. They're putting it through a centrifuge, spinning it, separating the plasma. And then because you have sodium citrate inside of there, they have to add in calcium because it kind of binds to the calcium to prevent it from clotting on the way to the lab. And then they add in tissue factor. And so that tissue factor is what would get released if I were to take like a, you know, a scalpel and cut my hand, it would release from the subendothelial collagen of that tissue into the blood. And then it would start that whole cascade. And typically it's like, you know, 12, 13 seconds or so that it takes for that to clot. But if you look at like different laboratories, they all have a different normal because of like what brand of a reagent they're using. So, you know, you could go over to North Carolina and they say, yeah, our control here is 15 seconds. And then you could go, let's say to Wisconsin and their control is like 13 seconds. Well, the INR is comparing the patient's PT with whatever the control is for that area. So that way you don't have these wide discrepancies just because you mm -hmm. went from one lab to another. So if my, if my PT is 15 and the normal is 15, it's going to be one. My INR is going to be one at this hospital. And if my PT is 13 and the normal is 13, it's going to be one at this other hospital. So that's why the INR is called the International Normalized Ratio, or that's what INR stands for. So that way, these hospitals can all communicate with each other, no matter what the reagent they're using is. And so in the case that I presented, Betty Crocker, she had an elevated INR, and she had an epidural head bleed. Mm -hmm. And so you have to reverse that. And so it's interesting when you think about the reversal process, because what you're doing is you're saying, okay, I know the body's not able to recycle and activate that vitamin K because the epoxide reductase is inhibited. It's not working. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give them vitamin K, but that graduation ceremony is like six hours long, right? So it's going to take them a while to start maturing those two, seven, nine, and 10, those four factors. 
in order for them to start participating in clotting. So what you do is you give the vitamin K early and, you know, you give it slow so you don't cause an anaphylactoid reaction. And then what you do is you give them four factor PCC, which is already like matured um, factors two, seven, nine, and 10. So that way they bring in in the graduates, the people that have already graduated. They don't have to wait for anything. They're like people that are already ready for the job. They're set to go. It's almost like bringing in like pool or float workers into the clotting cascade, right? Yeah, exactly. You're bringing in some part time workers. You know, the body is going to start to break those down at about like that seven, eight hour mark. And and they're going to uh, dissolve and they're not going to be there anymore. But that's great because that's right when the vitamin K starts working. So there's this nice overlap with that. And so uh, K Centra four factor PCC is is very common. It's a little expensive Um, for a while. It was just plasma because plasma had active two, seven, nine, and 10 that they could mm-hmm. put in. You have to give more plasma. You had to give like quite a bit, like usually like four or five units of plasma. And you're only going to bring the INR down to the level of whatever the INR was of that plasma, right? So it's not mm-hmm. going to be perfect. But in this situation, it does, should definitely be better than six. And that's so- an immediate fix. Like you don't have to wait for the body to build it up or break it down or anything that's going to immediately start working. Yeah. So, so typically you see them, maybe they give a sub Q injection of a vitamin K like 10 milligrams where they run it in over like 30 minutes or so. And then they got K Centra going on right away. Cause that's going to actually help you in that acute phase. Cause if you had to wait six to eight, you know, eight hours for the vitamin K to kick in mm-hmm. and you're bleeding into your head, you can see where uh, you're going to be behind the eight ball with that. So, when I when I realize like it's not a vitamin K antagonist, it's preventing that whole graduation ceremony from occurring. That explained like why it takes vitamin K so long to work because it has to mature those factors. And the factors that are in K Centra are exactly that two, seven, nine, and ten. So it's interesting, and I, and I think that uh, the the framing of how this this case plays out. Um, I put a little uh, a little quiz, a little question at the end where I asked, why do you think her INR was so elevated? And so there's some uh, some questions and stuff or I should not questions, but some clues throughout the blog that should lead you to uh, figuring out why her INR was elevated. Yeah, I just pulled up the blog. Um, you said you had a. Uh, I thought you had a something about the medications that she was on, right? I guess we shouldn't ruin it for people, but there's something about, there's something about her very recent history because, um, for those of you, Tyler brought out that a normal, you know, he talked about, you know, if the, if the current standard for the lab is 13 and your PT is 13, well, you divide those by each other and it's one. So if the patient takes way longer, because remember that PT was measured in seconds. So if, you know, it's 26, that's twice as long as the control. So the INR would be two. And, depending on the patient had atrial fibrillation, which that's an issue. I mean, most people will, will learn this that, you know, the, the atrium is just quiver. And so because they're not forming a strong contraction, uh, blood can just start to pool up and it can sit on the wall or, you know, whatever, and can form a clot in there. So those people, usually they try to raise their INR to, you know, between maybe two and three. But once you go above kind of the level where they determine because it's always a risk versus reward type deal. Like, okay, you have atrial fibrillation. We can't get you out of it. We're going to thin your blood. But clearly if that patient falls, it's like, well, there's the risk right there. And now this patient has a head bleed, right? So if your INR is six and it's double the, you know, it's, it's supra therapeutic, your blood has been way too thin. Well, then, then that's an issue. I did read something one time that, you know, you can have like really crazy INRs, but after a certain point, it's like, it doesn't matter. Like after it gets to like, I don't remember what the number was like 10. 10. I didn't look it something. up prior to the, is it around there? I think so. I've heard that too. Yeah. Yeah. After, after a certain point, it's just, it takes so long that it's, it could be like a hundred at that point. And then, you know, cause I've heard of some that are like in the double digits. And I remember thinking the first time that I heard of that, um, I'm like, is this patient going to just turn into a pile of jelly on the, <laughs> on the couch or like, what's going to happen to this patient? But then uh, the I looked that up and and it was like, yeah, I think it was around 10. You know, maybe we can put a note in the blog on uh, what that number is it gets up to. And it's like it, it can only get so bad. It's not like your INR could be 100 and all of a sudden, yeah, you start. I mean, some patients are lower than that. They start bleeding from their eyes. But 
their blood pressure gets high enough, but it's not like super, super, you know, bad. And it might take more long or longer to reverse, but it's not the, the end of the world as long as they don't have like a trauma or something. You know, what's interesting is that, you know, so, so warfarin went on to be marketed as like a rodent aside or, you know, like a rat poison and it didn't I never know how to say it. Rodanticide. 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 I know. I was sitting there thinking the same thing. Um, so I just say rat poison. But like if you if you read about it, like the rats built up a tolerance to it. And so Coumadin is not not super long acting, you know, and I, I couldn't tell you the exact half of life of it. But I know that they invented something called Brodificum, which they called a super warfarin that was like very long acting. And it worked the same way by blocking that epoxide reductase, but it just like did not let it come back. I mean, it was like damaging the the switch for recycling that vitamin K. And there was a like a, a I don't say a breakout or something where uh, K2 spice, like the synthetic marijuana, there was this brodificum being put in it. It was coming up mm-hmm. through like Chicago. And Dan Rasiniak and Howard Greller from the Dantastic Mr. Tox and Howard have a, a really good episode on that. And they said that people were having to take vitamin K shots like every day for like weeks, months in order to to not bleed out and not to have internal bleeding. And so it's interesting to see like how that changes like the half life of it. So now if you see on the back of rat poison, Burdificum, that's like a super long acting one. And then there's also like nerve agents and stuff like that. Uh, but we can ask Moose all about that. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, for those who don't know, my uh, our puppy. So we were cleaning out our basement and our house is on a is on a hill. And so it's like backyard and then you can walk into the basement door and we were cleaning it out. And there's some areas that of the basement where um, there's like an old uh, part of the old foundation and like, it's, it's very low and there's like these weird crevices in it and stuff from a, a previous foundation. It's a, the, it was, there's a new house built on an old house. And anyway, so there was a, a piece of rat poison that we had no idea was down there. And of course, you know, we have a tiny puppy and he goes in there and, you know, he's like five inches off the ground. And so of course he sees, you know, anything underneath. And so he grabbed this piece of rat poison and it looked really old. So who knows if it was even current or if it even had like any of its because it must have been from before we even moved in. And so he just he ran into the basement and it's like he could smell rat poison. (laughs) Like he ran straight for this one specific little crevice and grabbed it and ran. And I was like, what in the world is that green stuff that he has in his mouth? It was like green, but looks kind of kind of like oxidized almost. And he was running around the backyard and he was so young. He like, you know, didn't have like, uh, you know, he, he wasn't responding to like a call or anything like that. So we had to like chase him down in the backyard to get it. And Kimchi. so, yeah, we ended up having to take him in. And uh, cause I'm like, oh, this is rat poison. That's really great. And he's practically the size of a rat. Like he's, he's <laughs> dead, you know? And so knowing about this Brudificum stuff from listening to that podcast from um, Toxin Hound, I was like, oh, crap, you know, like this stuff is is crazy. And, and he's he's going to be bleeding out of his eyeballs pretty soon here. Uh, his his INR never elevated. So it, in my mind, I was thinking like, OK, he's going to eat this. They're going to say we took him to the emergency vet and his INR is going to be sky high immediately. And then they told us, well, it might you know, we don't have the original package. So maybe it's a nerve agent. There's also um, renal toxic agents. There's also um obviously the blood thinners as well. And they're like, we don't know which one it is. The only one that we can treat is the brudificum. And so we had to give, they gave us like, well, they didn't give us, actually it was really expensive. Get all these vitamin K shots. Like they gave us one CC syringes of vitamin K shots. And seriously, it was like, a bucket's worth, like a like a gallon, like it a looked paint like the Terminator's gallon. like chest thing with all the yeah. Bullets. It was <laughs> like that. Like I could have made like a <laughs> I could have made like a machine gun thing out of him, like a belt fed machine gun thing, and worn it. And so we had to give him not shots, but we had to give it to him orally every day because um, I can't remember the exact mechanism, but the um, the veterinarian was talking about how it could take some time for his vitamin K stores to go down. Because my thought was like, why do we have to give this to him if his if his INR isn't low? And then we had to go back another week after. And this is very similar to like how a, a human. So we're not just talking about you know veterinary medicine. This is very similar how it would happen in a human as well. Even if the INR isn't initially low, 
um, the thought was that he could run out of vitamin K stores later on and have an acute drop um, and essentially the INR go through the roof. So even though his INR never dropped, there was still a chance that it could all of a sudden after his vitamin K stores ran out. Um, or if that flip was unable to be switched and he was unable to activate them or, or access his liver stores. So we had to give it to him because it's safe to give. You know, he can eat all the vitamin K that he wants. Apparently, Did that, uh, did that veterinarian sell you some oceanfront property in uh, Arizona? Too? <laughs> <laughs> it, it was I can't remember how much it was for that vitamin K, <laughs> but it was it was not it was not cheap. I remember we had just gotten that dog and. Our, yeah, that was the first shocking trip to the vet and i was like whoa <laughs> this is crazy but yeah we had to give it to him every day and he's fine obviously but uh yeah that was a scary thing but same thing i mean it that those vitamin k stores your acts your ability to access vitamin k could drop later on um i don't i don't know it, i think this stuff either the vitamin k worked or he or it, it was so expired that it didn't affect him but who knows cool man all right. Well, guys, have a great weekend. Happy Friday. I got the uh, the Hawaiian Friday shirt on. And a, it was a, a casual edition. Friday in the old salt mines. A new addition to the office, Sam. I don't know if you can see the uh, the old picture. That back is the there. most disgusting thing. Just remember, <laughs> man, payback. But uh, next week, I'll be coming back with a new uh, a new post on more lab value stuff. So I'm going to do another nice. reference post on but on anions this time. So we're kind of working our way from the left side to the right side of that uh, that diagram. So we did cat, or cations, positive charges. Next week is going to be negative charges. And there's some pretty cool stuff that we can touch on in there. I'll probably link that older blog about the uh, about the anion gap stuff that I did too. So we'll talk about a little like acid, a little bit of um, bicarbonates, a little bit of chloride stuff, saline, anion gap, stuff like that. So Stuff that's like acutely applicable. So that'll be cool. And we'll have to we'll have to get some more team members to throw some videos in, maybe if they feel like it, or maybe we'll we'll chat about that on here. But uh yeah, absolutely. And Tyler's got a few classes on this stuff for the reversal rehearsal. So check out the live portion and the recorded portion of the uh of the refresher as well. I think that's about it. Yeah, man. Sounds are you gonna keep the same outer limits theme, the space theme mm -hmm. with the anti? All the way through. Nice dude. All right, man. Peace. Peace.